Australian Aborigines are an ancient people, but they no longer look like their ancestors who arrived all those thousands of years ago. Their bodies have adapted, retaining all those characteristics needed to survive as hunter-gatherers in the harsh desert environment. Under the skin, we are all very much alike. Our DNA shows that we come from one very small gene pool. If we look at the DNA of all of us, Australians, Africans, Europeans, we find that comparing the mitochondrial DNA of all of us, we show less variation. Even though there are billions of us and we're spread over the whole world, we show less variation in our mitochondrial DNA than we would find in, say, a small group of chimpanzees or orangutans or gorillas. Those apes show more variation, even in their small groups, than the entire human race shows. But if all the people from around the world descend from such a small gene pool, why do we all look so completely different? Natural selection and adaptation to the environment are the most important factors. Sexual selection is crucial. Climate dictates body shape. The colder the environment, the shorter and more stocky you become to retain heat. Height relates to diet. The most obvious and striking difference is color. And that's also a part of our genetic inheritance. Nina Jamblonski, a leading scientist looking at the evolution of skin color, was working on the importance of folic acid in fetal development when she stumbled by chance on the answer. I started doing research on the evolution of skin color after preparing a lecture for a class over 10 years ago. It was interesting, preparing for the class, I realized that there was very little that was known about the evolution of skin color, and what was known wasn't very cogent. I discovered an interesting paper when I was preparing that lecture that showed that there was an interesting and important relationship between ultraviolet radiation and an, a very important biomolecule called folate. Folic acid is crucial for embryonic development, and too much ultraviolet radiation from the sun destroys it. So our ancestors in tropical Africa needed to be dark to protect their survival but too little ultraviolet prevents the formation of vitamin D, causing rickets, which can kill. So as they migrated to the sunless north, they had to grow paler to survive. She has uncovered a very simple evolutionary equation. When we look at the pattern of skin pigmentation among indigenous peoples today, we see very dark people in equatorial regions with high UV and significantly lighter people as we get toward the poles. And it turns out that melanin, the natural sunscreen, is phenomenally good at screening out ultraviolet radiation. To some extent, it's too good. And in order for us to be able to make enough vitamin D in our skin, we have to reduce the amount of melanin that exists in the skin. And so what we see in the course of our species history, as we've moved from an area of high UV to areas of lower UV, our skin has become more and more depigmented. She calculates that it takes about 20,000 years to turn from black to white. All that distinguishes color in people are tiny genetic differences laid down long ago. During the epic beach combing migration from Africa to Australia, our family left behind colonies. One group made their way up through Asia and to China and beyond. Another went from North India, past the Himalayas, onto the vast Asian steppes, and another stayed in the Arabian Gulf. Large freshwater lakes allowed our out of Africa families to colonize these pockets of lush vegetation surrounded by desert. Continuous occupation occurred here for more than 30,000 years, their bones and artifacts becoming submerged as sea levels rose. About 50,000 years ago, 
genetic lines began for the first time to spread north into Europe. But the timing has always been a puzzle. If modern humans are able to reach Australia as early as 70,000 years ago, why did they not arrive in Europe until 50,000 years ago? It is a much shorter journey. Stephen Oppenheimer thinks he has the answer. I think the answer to this question is that they were stuck. They were not able to get up to the Near East, to Israel and the Lebanon, because there was a great desert in the way. That desert was the Saudi Arabian desert and the Libyan desert. And between 80,000 and 50,000 years ago, this was completely impenetrable. The climate was so dry that the fertile crescent, the route from the Gulf into uh, Lebanon and Israel and Europe was closed. Then, 50,000 years ago, there was a sudden improvement of the climate. After centuries of domination by the desert, the rains came. Monsoon rainfall increased in Arabia and India, and the fertile crescent opened up. Rivers swelled and game spread north. Our families and genetic lines followed them. walked north from the Persian Gulf, deep into the Fertile Crescent, following the rivers between the Zagros Mountains and the Syrian Desert. The idea that Europeans came in through North Africa is very firmly fixed. But Stephen Oppenheimer's evidence does not support this. Genetic evidence completely does not support it. There's no evidence of the early branches. Uh, and in fact, only one of the main branches that people the world is found in the European region. Now, of course, that does upset a lot of fixed views about the origins of the Europeans and forces us to consider the fact that Europeans were part of the same single family that came out of Africa through the southern route. This new genetic evidence will rewrite European prehistory. These families founded the first successful modern human colonies in the Middle East, Syria and Levant, a land that lay between the rivers Tigris and Euphrates, two great rivers flowing from the high lands of Turkey in the north down to the Gulf. We have taken the first steps to the great civilizations that would develop writing, warfare, and found the great empires, all from one direct genetic route back to our out-of-Africa migration. <laughs>